What the heck happened in September last year? Let's find out. Welcome in to Fantasy Baseball today on Thursday, January 5th. Frank Stample joined by Chris Towers and making his triumphant return. New year, new hit. It is Scott White. Woo! Welcome back, Scotty. How were the holidays? New year, etc. What's going on, bud? They were great. I don't know that I have anything profound enough to say See, was, that would live up to say, that. In the in the lead up, like in the pre-show lobby, Frank said like new year, new you. And I, you know, I don't know if this like comes off wrong, but like I feel like no person has ever been less new year, new you than Scott. Like every time we're like, hey Scott, what happened? Nothing. <laughs> I, had no, I have nothing going on in my life. That's I spent a lot of time in a car. I drove 1,500 miles in all. And wow, that's a lot of miles. I got tired of driving. You know, whenever you go on a trip that long, you are guaranteed to have a near accident or two. And so that that makes you never want to do it again. But then you do because it is it, it, it remains the most cost-effective way to travel at least when you have a family of four, uh, even, even, you know, with fuel costs being what they are, it remains the most cost effective way to travel. So you end up doing it again and uh, taking your family's life in your hands again, over and over Jeez. again. Yeah, no, I'm pretty com com coming in on a dark note, right? That's, <laughs> That's all. You know, it's funny. My kids were watching Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, like the classic, you know, 1964 Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. 1964, a long time ago, right? So the opening credits, they have the opening credits playing, you know, and all the people who worked on the, the, the like, claymation or whatever it is, names popping up. And I just blurt out, all these people are probably dead. And it <laughs> didn't phase my kids at all because good, they're used good. to they're daddy learning. saying dark things. <laughs> New Year, same Scott. Well. <laughs> Today on the show, what happened late in the season and in September once football started? Chris, I know that obviously you make that transition a little love bit. Love this. I, I love this idea because some people, Scott, just stop paying attention to baseball once football season starts. And it's like, finally, Scott's going to catch up, you know? <laughs> I think it's the I think it's the other way around. Considering I wrote the article that inspired this podcast, no. Well, someone's a glory hound. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, there you go. Scott basically gave it away. We're going over an article. We're not going to get through everything because this is a massive article. I'll post the link in the podcast and the YouTube description, but you can search it out if you want to. Just go to Google, right? What happened in September? Fantasy baseball, and it's one of the top links there, but I'll post it anyway. Uh, and we're going to go through some of the biggest things that happened and kind of fill Chris in, fill in, you know, whoever's kind of returning to the fantasy baseball world uh, and let you know who helped win some championships, maybe who hurt us late in the season, some injury-related items, some prospect call-ups, a lot going on. But let's jump right in, and we are going to start with some pleasant surprises. And I think the two biggest names here are Jake McCarthy and Joey Manessis, which Scott highlights in the article. If you don't know who these players are or if you didn't know who they were before they got called up, that's perfectly fine because most of us didn't really know who they were anyway. Jake McCarthy was the third most rostered player on CBS championship winning teams. I got that data at the end of the season, uh, and obviously Jake McCarthy was a big reason for a lot of championship teams late in the year. He was recalled on July 11th, and from that point forward, to the end of the season, he hit 302 with five home runs and 22 steals, which led all of baseball. Joey Manessis, on the other hand, a 30-year-old journeyman. Uh, if you want to do the, the lazy comp thing, I guess we can say he's the Frank Schwindel uh, from this past season compared to, obviously, Schwindel from 2021. Joey Manessis got a chance to play with the Nationals. He played 56 games. He hit 324 with 13 homers and a 930 OPS. So he was pretty awesome down the stretch as well. Um, Chris, I guess we'll just start with you. Do you know anything about these two? Are you interested in either <laughs> of these two? Joey Manessis, Jake McCarthy. Yeah, Joey Manessis, also known as uh, the Battle of Bull Run. Um, Civil War battles would often have uh, two different names depending on the body of water or um, landmark that they were. No, that's not right. Okay, no, I, uh, fill me in. Uh, yeah, Joey Manessis, as I mentioned, he got an opportunity to play for the Washington Nationals late in the season, and he was awesome. So I think he's going to have this chance, at least early 
heading into uh, this season as well. They did just sign Dominic Smith, but Joey Manessas can either play a corner outfield spot or he could DH, whatever it might be. Uh, Scott, do you have any interest now? I guess I'll give you the early ADPs on these. According to NFBC, Jake McCarthy at 129. He's a 31st outfielder off the board. Joey Manessas going exactly 70 spots later. ADP is 199. What do you think about the early price tags for McCarthy and Joey Manessas? Well, I I don't know that I'm particularly moved by either. Uh, for McCarthy, obviously, he, he's getting that that big stolen base markup that we've become accustomed to in recent years. And as our audience is probably tired of hearing, but maybe maybe Chris Towers, not so much. Uh, we're expecting stolen bases to increase significantly across the league next year. So I don't know that even if McCarthy can sustain that pace, which was big. I mean, he stole 19 bases over the final two months. If, if you just take those final two months, that would have been the 25th most stolen bases in baseball. So like, it was a big contribution in that, in that uh, highly coveted category. Um, but I don't, I don't think, I don't think people who pay up for that are going to be as rewarded for it in 2023 as, as, as we've gotten used to, to them being, uh, in recent years. So I, I don't know that I want to pay that talking a 12 team league and 11th round price tag for, uh, somebody who's not going to provide you a lot of power. Now outfield thins out so quickly that, you know, just from a position scarcity standpoint, maybe that makes sense in a five outfielder league, but it's not something I'm going to make a high priority. That's for sure. Join Manessis, the price tag is a lot lower. And so just for that reason, I can see myself doing it more, but I imagine somebody like Tristan Casas is going even later. And yes, yep. now that it, how many picks later? Let's see. Oh, quite a bit. 40 picks or so, 50 picks. Quite a bit later. And like, I, I, that's a lot more upside there for Casas. And it seems like the Red Sox are committed to giving him the first base job. They obviously let Eric Hosmer go. And, um, you know, he was, he had a really strong finish too. I imagine we'll get to him at some point in these discussions. Now, join Manessis. I think he has a chance to it. Like it's easy to make the Frank Schwindel comparison because he was the, like, I don't know if he was exactly 30, but the, the old first base prospect getting a chance in the majors for the first time and delivering on it late in 2021. Uh, but the, Stat cast numbers look a lot better for Manessas. Like average exit velocity, 91.4 miles per hour. Uh, max exit velocity, 111. And those are good. Um, strikeout rate was solid. I, like there's reason to think Manessas could keep it going and, and maybe for the, the late round price tag, it's worth it. But, you know, I see other corner infielders that I like better in that range. Now, these players are very different, this comp that I'm about to make. But Chris, let me know if this makes any sense to you. Jake McCarthy right now kind of feels a little bit like Adolis Garcia from last year. I looked up the historical ADP over at the NFBC. Adolis Garcia was going at pick 171, so it's not completely similar. McCarthy's going, you know, a decent bit higher than that. But mm -hmm. an outfielder that kind of broke out, but people are maybe a little bit hesitant on. They don't know exactly, like, should I go in? Do I trust it? Do I not trust it? Obviously, Adolis Garcia followed that up with a monster season. Not saying McCarthy is necessarily going to do that, but I just think that there are kind of some similarities between the two situations. Do you see it as well for McCarthy? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say the the bigger difference would be, and and I think this applies to Manassas as well. Just you know, kind of taking a cursory glance is like we're talking about one guy who's thirty, one guy who Adolis Garcia was twenty eight when his breakout happened. McCarthy was twenty four, and so obviously that's not, I guess. 25 he probably did most of his damage after his july 30th birthday um but that's the the one thing that does stick out to me is like it's a lot harder to write off or it's a lot harder to buy into a guy doing this as a 30 year old you know when you look at the minor league numbers and you see well jake mccarthy has a you know as what is an eight and 931 ops a triple a he's a little old for triple a you know being 23 and 24 when he was doing that but manessis was 29 you know, Adolis Garcia was 26, 27 when he was in AAA. So that's that's the key difference is like ages and everything. And, you know, there are late breakouts. But when a guy does it at 23, 24, you know, especially when you're talking about the minors, that's a lot easier to buy into than 28, 29. 
So I, I, that's the one thing when, when looking at these guys is McCarthy does have age going for him and, you know, a skill set in speed that, you know, can translate fairly fluidly. All right, let's move on to another one here. O'Neill Cruz and his strikeout rate. Chris, obviously you are well-versed in O'Neill Cruz. You know everything he was doing mm -hmm. last year. He broke the record for max exit velocity. Just some mammoth home runs last year and really just put on a show. But he did struggle at times. Late in the season, he kind of fixed some of those struggles. In September, he hit 288 with six home runs, five steals, and 884 OPS, and a sub-30% strikeout rate. Just below 29.8% strikeout rate. Before that, it was 37.8%. So this is actually a pretty big jump, pretty big improvement month over month for O'Neill Cruz. Still has to improve against left-handed pitching. I mean, he was uh, abysmal against them, 158 batting average with a 53% strikeout rate. Uh, but Scott, how much are you buying this late season improvement from O'Neill Cruz? His early ADP is 76. Yeah, and that might be one of those cases where it's it's in the only ADP still that we're working with is an FBC and an FBC you're more incentivized to sell out for upside and like O'Neill Cruz has a ton of upside clearly so I don't know that when we get uh, ADP data back from from all the other sites and, and we take the average on on fantasy pros uh, that he's going to clock in quite that high I have him ranked a little bit lower than that for sure um, I do think I have him well, I have him behind Dansby Swanson for one, behind Xander Bogarts, maybe ahead of Tim Anderson and Wander Franco, at least in, in Roto Leagues. But obviously it's a it's a crowded position at the top. And 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 so that that's partly what pushes O'Neal Cruz down despite the upside. The thing is, like he impacts the ball so hard. You mentioned him setting the stat cast record that he doesn't need he doesn't need to have a good strikeout, right? It's, it's similar to when Aaron Judge was first breaking into the league. Aaron Judge mm -hmm. is not such an extreme strikeout guy anymore, but at the start, he was striking out 30% of the time, and it didn't matter because he hit the ball so hard. I think O'Neal Cruz fits into that same category. His final strikeout rate was 35%. That's still maybe a little higher than you want to see, but for, that, for the month of September, it was only 29.8%. It was right around where Aaron Judge used to be. Um, and at that level, it basically didn't matter for Cruz either. For that month with the 29.8 strikeout rate, hit 288, six home runs, five steals, and 884 OPS. I mean, certainly we'll take is, that. Is doable. Like, yeah. if you have high enough skill, if you have a high enough skill level elsewhere, you know, yesterday I, I, I said that Bobby Witt was more a collection of interesting skill sets than an actual baseball player. And that's much more true of someone like O'Neill Cruz than even Bobby Witt, like he is, uh, you know, he's got the, the fastest throwing uh, arm in um, of any infielder and he hits the ball harder than anybody and he's super fast and all that. Like, he's, he's a, you know, we throw around the word freak a lot. Like he is legitimately like a one of one kind of athlete. Um, but, you know, baseball is not just a, a combine. And what we saw last year, I think that the biggest thing for me and, and what I'm trying to look at as I'm as I'm talking is how many lefties did he face in September? I'm trying to go through the, the splits tool um, and just see what the what that looked like, because that would be a big deal. You know, if he didn't sit, face as many lefties, then I, I don't know how much to take from it. And and frankly, you know, obviously with young players, you want to see improvement. And so you don't want to write that off, but I tend to be pretty skeptical of, well, the calendar turned to September and then this had, and it's like, well, that <laughs> that's hard. Like, you know, that, that that's hard to buy into for me. Chris, I appreciate, appreciate that you're wearing the New York shirt and with your new setup, for those who don't know, Chris had a little move in the, in the yeah. off season here. Could you um, hear the, the J train? I, I know every single time there's a train going by, <laughs> I hear it in the background. Yeah. I'm accustomed to it. Some people who are listening or watching might be like, what is that sound every couple? I try. I try to mute it. Uh, they're they're shutting it down apparently. So hopefully, you know, it'll become less uh, less of an issue, and and maybe my rent will stay cheaper once they shut the train down for two years. So, hey, you know, fingers crossed. I'm praying for you, bud. Uh, O'Neill Cruz, by the way. Last thing I'll point out again: big struggles against left-handed pitching. I looked into his splits against lefties by season in mm -hmm. the minor leagues. This is according to uh, Milb.com. 
Uh, he hit 220 in 2022, which obviously you don't like. 328 in 2021, 321 in 2019, 375 in 2018, 197 in 2017, 200 in 2016. So there is a lot going on right there. There, it's different levels uh, of the minors. It's different sample sizes. So you know, do with that what you will. But he has shown the ability to hit against lefties at times throughout the minor leagues. So yeah. Just- in- in September, he had 34 plate appearances against lefties. Um, if I'm doing this right, he still struck out 17 times. So still half of his Yikes. plate appearances against lefties, he struck out in, in he September. Was, he was in September out of the lineup against three of the lefties the Pirates faced, yeah. which is interesting. They faced eight, and he was out for three of them. So it's, you know, obviously rookie season and not – a full season at that other interesting thing about O'Neill Cruz. And I don't want to make this whole thing about him. Cause obviously we'll have plenty of time to talk about him. Like even if, even if you're not counting on him, improving his strikeout rate, 35%. Okay. That's what he's stuck at. He still hit yeah. two two thirty three. Okay. Not great, but not a disaster. He's not going to kill you. 17 home runs, 10 steals and a little more than half seasons time. Right. How many games is that? Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's kind of like what if Miguel Sano could steal twenty five bases, like <laughs> the good like peak Miguel Sano back when he was running massive babips and hitting thirty homers and and striking out thirty five percent of the time. Like just as like just as he is two thirty three hitting two ninety four on base percentage thirty five percent strikeout rate. He might be a thirty twenty guy. So yeah, you know. I, I want to take him as early as he's going on NFBC, but I but I understand. Joey Gallo has been a top 100 player before without you know cutting his strikeout rate in a huge way. And without having massive steal steals yeah. totals, which O'Neill Cruz can obviously provide as well. Let's stay in the NL Central here with the Cincinnati Reds and two pitchers that we were kind of off and on all season with last year. They really finished strong down the stretch for the Cincinnati Reds. Nick Lodolo, his final six starts, he had a 2.48 ERA, a 0.88 whip, 12K per nine. Hunter Green, his final four starts, a sub one ERA, a sub one whip, 14K per per nine. And he actually threw a slider less during that time. Uh, So do with that what you will. The control got better, 2.7 walks per nine. The early ADP for each of these, Hunter Green at pick 120, Nick Lodolo at pick 135. And Scott, what I'm learning is that Unsurprisingly, they are early breakout picks for many people around the industry, which makes sense given the strikeout upside for each of them. Yeah. No, the reason you mentioned he threw his fastball more during that time, Hunter Green, is because for it it being one of the best ever in terms of velocity, it, it seemed like it got hit pretty hard and we wanted him to throw the slider more. And so I still think that's an issue. Uh, and... You know, we're we we're given just the numbers over the those last few starts: five for Green, six for Lodolo. Um, it was a sharper turnaround for Green. Like even though he had a, a an 0.62 ERA over those final um, five starts, his final ERA was 4.44. You know, so I I think he's going to little higher relative to other upside pitchers for me because I, I feel like he has more downside than than like a Nick Lodolo or a Jesus Lazardo, for instance. Uh, so I don't see myself drafting much of green. It's it's another case where like, okay, yeah, the talent is there, but I just I'm just not willing to um, like there's plenty of talent for those other guys too and I, I, when you're factoring in both the best case scenario and the worst case scenario, it doesn't quite balance for me uh, at the expense of those other guys. Yeah, it's a really interesting range right now where pitchers are going to. You got the two Yankees guys in Severino and Nestor Cortez just ahead of Hunter Green, then Blake Snell, who like that's it's not even close for me. I have Sev- especially Severino quite a bit ahead of Green. Yeah, I mean, he has a longer track record, and he was really good last year. It's just, can he stay on the field? That's a consistent issue for Luis Severino. Clayton Kershaw is in this range. Lance Lynn, who we'll get to in a bit, he finished really strong down the stretch. Freddie Peralta, we know, has massive upside, but can he stay on the field as well? So it's a really interesting range for starting pitcher. Uh, Chris, do you see enough here with either of these two, Nick Lodolo and Hunter Green, where you might want to buy in 
at this cost, maybe just inside the top 150 picks. This is a range where I tend to like drafting starting pitchers anyway, so I think I'll probably end up with a decent amount of these guys. It's it's tough with Hunter Green just because he's such a, in many ways, a one-dimensional pitcher at this point in his career. Um, you know, I guess maybe two-dimensional pitcher, fastball, slider, if we want to call those dimensions, but, you know, it, it's... It's a really hard profile to make work as a right-handed pitcher, you know, just fastball slider because you're often going to have platoon issues. And I think with, with him, you know, the, the big issue is he throws his fastball 60% of the time. At this point in Major League Baseball, that's really high. Uh, that used to be pretty normal. If In fact, it you know, might not have even been all that low uh, a while back. But and in this era, if you're throwing your fastball more than 55% of the time, you're you're a pretty heavy fastball thrower. And his fastball for all the velocity that he gets is very hittable and it's very inconsistent when it comes to swings and misses. He had a 40% whiff rate uh, in the month of September and that was great and that helped, you know, fuel it, but it was more like 25 to 30%. And that's still a very good whiff rate for a fastball, but when you only have the slider to fall back on, it, it it's tough. And, um, you know, I, there's a lot of like seam shifted wake or uh, a, a attack angle, th those things that I'm not smart enough to understand. I've been left behind by the advanced revolution. Um, but I think what it comes down to a lot of it is just, can he figure out either a way to get a third pitch? What's that? That was my choo-choo. The yeah. train is going by. <laughs> it's, it's whenever I start talking, you know. Um, <laughs> Can he make the slider like a Chris Sale type weapon? Because Chris Sale has made being a two pitch pitcher work for him. Um, I mean, he has a changeup, but you know, it's similar usage. Or can he make the fastball really, really good? Um, and it's it depends on what you want to bet on. But I don't know. I I'll probably have some Hunter, or, uh, yeah, Hunter Green, but I, I won't. I'm not planning currently to make him like a huge, huge focus. Yeah, I do think. Scott, the way you laid it out, I think Hunter Green has a wider range of outcomes. I think his his upside is higher than a Nick Lodolo. I think his floor is much lower than Nick Lodolo. I think Lodolo is more polished at this point. The fact of the matter is that these two guys still pitch in Cincinnati, which is the worst venue to pitch in, statistically, according to StatCast Park Factors, for home runs in yeah, all of baseball. Runs. So it, yeah. it it is a problem for both of these guys. Even with it's, that, it's, a, it's kind of it's a distant first in home runs. Yeah, really, it's not close. Point. And yeah. even with that, Lodolo actually pitched very well at home last year, and he was bad on the road. So I, I think that will kind of even out a little bit. But uh, I yeah. think I trust Lodolo a little bit more. than Well, I it's Green. it's just and 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 you know, Green Lodolo. It was a very close call for me. I have Lodolo one spot ahead of Green, and I have Jesus yeah. Lazardo one spot ahead of Lodolo. So like, <sighs> I, I see those three as very similar in terms of upside, downside, risk. Uh, but like, you know, I'm looking at these ADP and I see uh, Clayton Kershaw behind Hunter Green. I, I see Luis Severino in that same range, as you pointed out, Lance Lynn behind Hunter Green. Uh, I don't know if we're going to get to him, but he he had a very strong finish. Um, and I mean, Chris Sale even. And like, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I can get on board with that. All right. One thing Green does have going for him is just he did make every start, right? He threw 125 innings. That was uh, 25, 22 more than uh, Lodolo made in the majors, a couple more, like a, a dozen more than he made overall. Yeah. He, he did have a Tommy John surgery in the minors, yeah. so I don't know that we can really tout health for Green. Yeah, yeah. It's just he's he's been good since, I would say, and, and it's worth noting that he had very, very little minor league experience before making it to the majors last year. Like he, he had he even thrown a hundred innings total in the minors? He had barely, yeah, 106 and a third the year before. Yeah. So barely. Yeah. Uh, all right, let's move on to some concerning developments here later on in the season. And we'll start off. Actually, all three of these are pitchers here. No surprise. There's always something going on with pitchers, especially late in the season. Shane McClanahan was dealing with a shoulder impingement and he missed a couple of weeks at the start of September. Once he returned his final four starts, a 5.21 ERA, only 12 strikeouts, over 19 innings pitched, a 10% swinging strike rate. The velocity, I will point out, was perfectly fine, uh, and he did put together a strong start in the postseason where he gave up two runs over seven innings pitched, five strikeouts to zero walks. The early ADP for Shane McClanahan is 
39. So he's still going relatively early. Chris, do you have any major concerns about this late season shoulder impingement for Shane O'Mac? He's a pitcher who throws 97 miles an hour. So yeah. And there were concerns coming up as a prospect about whether he'd be able to fit in as a starter in the long term. And so I think you have to have some concerns, but like, I, I don't know. It, it, it's pitcher got hurt and wasn't as good. Well, yeah, that's, that's a tale as old as time, right? Like that's, that's going to happen there. There are more pitchers who that's true for than it's not true um, at some point in the season. So there's definitely concerns. There's definitely red flags. 39 doesn't, doesn't strike me as unreasonable for a pitcher who's as talented as Shane McClanahan. He's the 13th pitcher, 12th uh, starting pitcher off the board in NFC draft. So, you know, you got a little bit of, you know, the, the starting pitcher price deflation going on there, which seems fine. You know, a, a third round pick in either 15 or 12 team leagues, that, that seems reasonable. He's actually the it looks like starting pitcher. I think oh, ninth, okay. I ninth, didn't even ninth starting pitcher. There's, there's, a, there's, a lot, pitcher. there's a lot of closers, at least in these 15 right. team roto leagues yeah. going very, very early. But that's interesting that he's going as late as ninth, like behind – uh, Spencer Strider and Dylan Cease, for instance, because I thought I was being kind of wary of uh, of drafting McClanahan. I mean, he has the profile of a number one over uh, number one pitcher taken. Mm -hmm. uh, he has that type of profile because he's got the uh, outlier swing and miss skills and outlier ground ball skills and no real control problems uh, to go with it. So, uh, you know, I thought I was being a little cautious considering that, ranking him where I do sixth at starting pitcher, and then, and yet he's going ninth on average. Like, I'm not going to draft any of these pitchers anyway. So, you know, it, 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 it kind of feels like a moot point for me to nitpick what order they go in. And, you know, we've talked this offseason about how I've, Justin Verlander is my number one starting pitcher for next year, and at least – According to this, this one site's early data, um, he's what twelfth, and I have him number one at the position. So that that's like a big. Clearly, I am. I don't know if it's just me. I'm out of step with everyone else, or if it's just there are a lot of arguments you could make for which pitcher to take first through twelfth. You know, um, but since. I'm probably going to punt on that whole range of starting pitchers. You know, I, I kind of don't care that much either. I think you are the prime anti-ageist, by the way, Scott. So that probably helps you rank Justin Verlander first, where I think other people who draft are maybe a little bit more wary when it comes to age, at least for starting pitchers. Well, I, I, I'm the opposite. Like, I, I don't think it's such a bad thing. Uh, among all the risk factors you have going on at starting pitcher, what's going on with Shane McClanahan's innings accumulation and, and and the way his arm didn't hold up for even 160 innings last year like that seems to me a bigger risk factor than oh justin verlander's 40 yeah you know? and it, it might be like hitters in general have fewer risk factors than that um so that's why age is a bigger issue for me among hitters than pitchers I heard it, Chris. I don't know if anyone else. I, I didn't it. hear it. Chris said he is a Met, though. When it comes oh, to yeah. you know, so things so. tend to things tend to go a little Metsy. My sometimes. number two pitcher is Max also Scherzer. a Met. Yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> what can go wrong will go wrong. Just kidding, Mets fans. Don't come for me. I'm sorry. Uh, Garrett Cole is next up here. I wanted to mention he allowed nine home runs over his final five starts. He actually led the American League with 33 home runs allowed, and during this final five start stretch. His ERA jumped from 3.2 to 3.5. Chris, I don't know if you saw this in the offseason. There was a story that came out about mm -hmm. these quote-unquote Goldilocks baseballs that were being used uh, more so in Yankee games than anywhere else. Or, or I think they were only being used in Yankee games, and they were bouncier, and some people speculated it was part of the Aaron Judge home run chase and so on and so forth. But as a result, that, that might have led to Garrett Cole allowing more home runs. So whatever theory you subscribe to, the fact of the matter is that Garrett Cole gave up a lot of home runs last year. Will that deter you from ranking him as, I don't know, one of your top two or three starting pitchers this season? Garrett Cole be giving up home runs sometimes, guys. That's who he's always been, even when he's been really good. I mean, you look at his career. I just pulled up every five-game rolling uh, start for him. 
He had a stretch in 2017 where he gave up eight home runs. He had a stretch in 2020 where he gave up nine home runs. He had a stretch in 2021 where he gave up nine home runs. Had a stretch in 2021 where he gave up eight home runs separate from that one. Like, this is who he is. You know, he, he's he's a fly ball pitcher. And what we've seen with Garrett Cole over the past couple of seasons, since the, the sticky stuff cracked down especially, is the margin for error for him is a lot narrower, narrower than it used to be because he's a guy who – Pounds the strike zone, you know, throws a lot of high fastballs, and he's always given up a decent number of home runs. He's had one season since 2017 with a home run rate below not below one per nine. Like that's just who he is. Now it doesn't really bother me. I think at this point you probably don't expect Garrett Cole to have a 250 ERA or a 280 ERA anymore. I think he probably is a a low to mid threes ERA guy, but you're gonna get really good strikeout numbers and a ton of innings relative to the rest of the pitcher pool. And you're going to get very good whip and, and a bunch of wins. And so it's like, yeah, you're going to have to live with the occasional stretch where he gives up too many home runs. But I think it, it's the kind of situation where you, you probably just don't overthink it. You know, maybe he's not the number one starting pitcher with a bullet anymore because of that. But I, I really can't bring myself to get too concerned about Garrett Cole. The, whip you know, the, is still the really nice good. thing is, go ahead. When he gives up home runs, nobody's on base. You know, yep. like that, that's you can live with that. Uh, sort of. I mean, like I, I look at the other starting pitchers in the conversation, and 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 for me, it's always been like a top seven, but let's say it's top twelve in the conversation to take sure. in in rounds one, two. Um, like Garrett Cole's the clearest ERA liability even if you throw out the 350 mark because he allowed nine home runs in his final five starts uh maybe because maybe the goldilocks ball is having something to do with that or not even if you throw that out you know he had a 320 era entering those final five starts his era in in 2021 was 323 uh, with the way uh with the way pitchers are trending um and just the the caliber of pitchers drafted in that same range like a 320 era is high like he is mm -hmm. you're not getting you're not getting the um the clear benefit in in the category i think people focus on most so i have him fifth in my starting pitcher rankings for next year again probably not drafting any of these guys but cole is fifth for me behind verlander scherzer corbin burns and sandy alcantara with alcantara being number one in points leagues Scott, I feel like we've talked about this a lot already this offseason that there has been a return to the middle class for starting pitchers, and overall it makes the position look a lot deeper than it has been in recent years. And uh, I've been reading some things, been doing a little research. Baseball Forecaster is a great publication from Baseball HQ. Highly recommend it. Uh, and they make some good points about how if there's a shift ban, uh, it could lead to more hits and it could lead to, you know, higher ERAs and all the, it seems like things are kind of being promoted for offense mm -hmm. moving forward, at least balls in play. And that, balls could, in play, yeah. that could maybe affect, you know, a Merrill Kelly type or like a Johnny well, Cueto, someone who like puts the ball in play. So it's just something I think we, we have to think about a little bit more. I'm not saying like completely change your entire mindset this off season, but maybe the middle yeah. class isn't as deep as like we're kind of thinking. Early. Well, I, I think I think what could change, you know, there, there's been so much emphasis for me in particular in recent years on the ground ball pitchers, and I was talking it up for Shane McClanahan recently, and I think it, it could be a situation where, and, and it's not going to be a total apples to apples thing, but fly ball pitchers. I mean, we saw a few pitchers this past year, uh, Nestor Cortez, uh, Tristan McKenzie. Uh, guys who don't have big strikeout rates, but they have what during the juice ball era we would have considered scary fly ball rates, and they ended up being fantasy standouts in spite of that. And, you know, obviously infield shifting, that's not going to affect those guys. Uh, limiting the infield shifts isn't going to affect those guys as drastically as it will ground ball pitchers in theory. I mean, you see some very smart people out there saying it's not going to affect much of anybody at all. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of like, well, why was anybody shifting in the first place if yeah, if it right. doesn't matter? Um, so I, you know, and and I, I, so I think you have people arguing both extremes, and it's probably going to be somewhere in the middle. But yeah. the bottom line is, I think it's harder to assess starting pitchers now because there are there are threats out there beyond the long ball, uh, as as you're mentioning, Frank. And um, 
you know, not everybody who puts the ball in the air is as vulnerable to the long ball as they used to be. And yeah. One thing I would also add if we're talking about rule changes is like a pitcher like Garrett Cole could be less. I, I think generally speaking, the stolen base thing is probably like not something that you should take into account for stolen, for pitchers all that much because they're relatively rare events and like, you know, no Syndergaard might give up like 70 stolen bases this year. But like otherwise, most pitchers are probably not going to be all that impacted. But like a guy who generally doesn't get singled to death, you know, if there was going to be an impact from more stolen bases, a Garrett Cole would be less impacted. A home run's going to score a guy from sec first or second, you know, either way, if a guy's on base. If you're giving up, you know, if most of your runs come from, you know, churning out singles, you know, you're you're more likely to be affected adversely by stolen bases. This is not something that, like, is likely to be predictive. But, you know, when we're talking about the way the season plays out, there, there will be some pitchers who will be more adversely affected. And, and Garrett Cole seems like one who wouldn't be because of the the – the way he tends to get hurt. Mm -hmm. And it's just some food for thought, something to think about for now. And we'll have an episode or a segment where we kind of run through all the rule changes and how it might affect hitters and pitchers alike. Um, but yeah, it's just something to, to consider. And I think specifically right-handed pitchers who induce a lot of ground balls, I think they might be hurt the most just because lefties are obviously shifted the most. And if they're hitting balls on the ground, maybe that leads to more hits. But again, it's just something to get the wheels turning and, and start to think about. Before we hit the break, make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you're watching live or on demand, we appreciate it. Uh, tap the little notification bell so you uh, to let you know every time we go live or drop a new video. Also, we have a TikTok channel. We are hip, or so they tell us. You can follow at FBT Pod, uh, putting out some fun clips of this podcast, putting some highlights on there, uh, some original content that I've been making as well. So make sure to follow on TikTok at FBT pod. Let's take a break and we'll be back right after this. I've never lost a wingman. You're lucky. Fly long enough, it'll happen. It's been an honor flying with you. PG-13, now streaming on Paramount+. Plus. Let's get into some news and notes before we dive back into some late-season standouts. And, Chris, I guess Heimbloom listened to yesterday's podcast because... You're welcome, Boston. What does he do? Fans. First thing on Wednesday, boom! Massive extension for Rafael Devers. The Red Sox signed Devers to an 11-year, $331 million extension. The sixth largest deal in MLB history. Since the start of 2019, Devers is batting 292 with an 884 OPS, averaging 31 home runs per 150 games. Uh, the only thing for, I guess, Scott, his somewhat immediate value remaining in Boston, obviously he's very familiar there and so on and so forth. The Red Sox lineup is not nearly as good as it has been in years past, so maybe that affects his counting stats, but I think that's probably the only takeaway I have for Rafael Devers. Yeah, uh, I, I I didn't see major fantasy implications for this. Obviously, the Red Sox are, are kind of in a transition phase right now. I, I don't really view them as contenders next year. It's hard to see Devers counting stats getting worse than they were last year. I mean, you look at the drop-off in runs in RBI for him from 2021 to 2022. That's the reason he didn't live up to a first-round price tag. That said, like I'm drafting him late first round this year because of how early you want to shore up third base. And, um, you know, other than Jose Ramirez, who's in conversation for number one overall, I think Devers is, is the most appealing guy at that position. All right, Eric Hosmer agreed to a contract with the Cubs on Wednesday last year. He was not great. 268 batting average, eight home runs, a 716 OPS. And for those wondering if this will affect Matt Mervis, I spoke about it with the Welsh the other day. I don't think so because Mervis can obviously DH. They can switch off a little first, a little DH here and there. And maybe I'm just subscribing to the narrative, whatever it might be. But I kind of like having a veteran who's been there, done that. Hosmer was once a big prospect. He's won a World Series. They're both left-handed bats. 
I kind of just like a veteran like that being around a young prospect who's coming up. I really don't think this affects him very much. I don't know if either one of you have a thought or, you know, does this concern you when it comes to Matt Mervis? I, I think it's a contingency plan. I mean, the, the fact it's a one-year deal and, and for little financial commitment, it's kind of like, why not? We have probably the least proven first base men in the league and Mervis. But like I'd ra- just as as somebody who's looking at this strictly from a fantasy standpoint, I'd rather there be no contingency plan because that just gives the Cubs an excuse to leave Mervis out of the lineup more often. Yeah, uh, I think he can DH though. I, I don't think that's a problem. He DH a lot apparently in the Arizona Fall League. So again, sure I he can. Oh, I think he can but, handle it defensively. <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's just you know, and anyone. Because how many teams, especially teams in the Cubs situation, stick with the same lineup day in, day out? It's it doesn't happen often. So you just you you'd rather there be fewer guys playing the same position. We did have some veteran pitcher signings. The D backs re signed Zach Davies to a one year five million dollar deal. The Brewers signed Wade Miley to a one year four and a half million dollar deal. And uh Scott, the only thing that I think the takeaway here is how it affects the other young pitchers that are on those respective teams. For Arizona, obviously, we have varying levels of interest in a uh, Dre Jamison, in a Ryan Nelson. Brandon Fott is a is another pitcher that's coming soon. The Brewers have Aaron Ashby, who I guess, you know, there's still some intrigue there. Uh, do you think either of these pitchers can block those those young guys? I, I guess it, it obviously lowers their chances of, of winning an opening day job. But when push comes to shove, I mean, but particularly given the attrition that happens at starting pitchers, like teams need to have this kind of depth. They need to bring in Zach Davies and Wade Miley on small deals just because they're going to have innings that need to be filled at some point. Uh, but I think once they're confident, once the Diamondbacks are confident, Fat is ready. And um, I, I guess it's not even really a confident situation with Ashby. Ashby will be in the starting rotation at some point. Uh, but you know, it's less likely to be on opening day now. And that that's reason to take them a little later because uh, it's hard to hold on to, particularly if you're talking about a roto context, it's hard to hold on to a prospective starting pitcher. Yeah, that's a little discouraging. I, I kind of I kind of changed my tone mid <laughs> <laughs> mid answer there. Yeah, I, I think I'm I think I think it's less likely Ashby gets drafted now because you know, he's more likely to be in the bullpen than Wade Miley is to begin the year. Scott, your mic is kind of doing that weird thing. Maybe it's because you were talking to the side or whatever it is, but uh, you were kind of getting cut off a little bit. Do I have yep. to again? Still, still happening, bud. Oh, my so, goodness. We'll know. figure it out. Uh, apparently, the Padres and Marlins are both vying for the services of Johnny Cueto, and the Brewers acquired Bryce Wilson from the Pirates in exchange for cash considerations. Let's get back into some late-season standouts, some things you might have missed later on in the season. If you hopped over to football uh, or for whatever reason, maybe you just kind of fell out of baseball mode. Sigh of relief for some of these players. Mike Trout was diagnosed with a rare back condition that threatened to end his season, potentially threaten his career. He returned in late August and he hit 16 home runs, which tied Aaron Judge for the most during that stretch. He homered in seven straight at some point. 40 home runs for Mike Trout last year in 119 games. The early ADP is 24 as the ninth outfielder off the board. Chris, did you see enough late in the season to give you confidence to potentially use a second round pick on Mike Trout or, you know, these injuries starting to add up uh, some kind of weird things going on with the strikeout rate and the fly ball rate as well. Uh, is that enough to maybe fade Mike Trout as a second round pick? I have no idea if he can stay healthy. Like I, I there, it's an unanswerable question. He doesn't know. His doctors don't know. He's got this back injury. We don't really know, or this back issue that will become an injury at some point or will intermittently be an injury i i don't know i feel very confident that he is still if not the best hitter in baseball one of the two or three best hitters in baseball that's all you can feel confident in with him Uh, there's been i don't know you can look at oh his expected batting average was low and he struck out a little too like i i don't see any reason to doubt the performance when he's on the field if you're asking me if I can predict that he'll stay healthy, I, I have. It's impossible to say more so than any other player. I would guess he won't, but 
when he's out there, he's going to be awesome. I feel very confident in that. I mean, he's going to play more than Byron Buxton. Uh, There's no way of knowing. <laughs> Not so sure. Mike Trout. I mean, the, the early return, the immediate returns after this back issue. When remember, people were freaking out. Oh, his career is over. Yeah. And, and like he basically like... played every day and was the best power hitter, or at least the second best power hitter. And, and, and like that's the the thing about Trout is okay hasn't been a base deal in a long time, probably not going to change with the rule changes though. You know I I think I think everything although he's still on the table really still fast. fast right. Um, not a batting at not a like he's not going to hurt your batting average, but he's not a batting average standout anymore with the way his strikeout rate has gone up. Still, one of the best power hitters in baseball. Like he he's maybe a. Less dur- like I think worst case scenario if you're talking performance, less durable. Pete Alonso who plays the outfield, which is the scarcer position. Like I'd rather have Trout than Alonso. I'm I'm yep. easily I'm, I'll take him in the second round. You know I'm, I'm thankful I don't have to spend a first round pick on him anymore. Yeah. yeah, it might just be a difference in philosophies here. I I just maybe I just play it too safe in the early rounds, but just. Not, I mean, not, I, I, probably not gonna I, have. I feel like I'm a safe in the early for in the early rounds kind of guy. I just, I, I, I think the risks are overblown here with Trout. He if has he, if he plays 125 games, he's going to be worth a second round pick. Chris, I know that you're a big fan of the Spider Man meme. I mean, this is uh, Jacob Degrom and and Mike Trout. It, it's right? not like, though. It's yeah. not because other than other than that hamstring issue, it was hamstring right in 2021. He hasn't missed these giant. It was a periods calf. of time calf. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Calf like that. And that's, you know, a calf strain. That's not the kind of thing that when there was no recurrence of that. Yeah. But now we right. have like a debilitating back injury. Scott. Right, but we, just... don't, we don't know if we do. Right. Like there was the one in interview where he talked about it and it was like right after he got the diagnosis and it, it wasn't like the doc said I can't play anymore. It was, you know, like. I don't know. I guess I would feel more concerned if he didn't come back and look like himself. Right. Sure. You know, like that, that's, I, I just, I think if he plays 125 games, you're, you're going to be fine with drafting him in the second round. Like last, last point, we'll, we'll do the thing where we're like, Oh, I knew it. I can't trust him. But like the replacement level outfielder that you stick in your lineup for the four weeks that he misses is not going to drag his the, the the value of that spot down enough to not make him worth it, you know? You know, here's a perfect comp, Chris, that I'll give you, and I feel like you could relate to very well. Christian McCaffrey in football, right? Just, hey, he can't stay healthy. What happened? He stayed healthy, and he was basically the number one player in fantasy football. So uh, I guess that's the argument for Mike Trout. I'm a little bit more concerned. Bo Bichette revived his season with a monster September. The final month, he hit 406 with seven homers, four steals, and an 1105 OPS, which took his batting average overall in the season from 260 to 290. 30 points in one month. Insane. His OPS from 725 to 802. Scott, the early ADP for Bo Bichette is 14 as the third shortstop off the board. And you know what? I kind of wish he didn't have that huge final month. Because I would much rather have a bigger discount on Boba Shed. I, I was pretty worried, though, to be perfectly honest. Like he's he's been a guy who's outperformed his um, his data over his career, and you know, with the changes to the ball and and power being suppressed across the league, it, it seemed like he might have been a victim of that until that big September, which, by the way, was the most prolific month for home runs last year. So, you know, that that introduces another wrinkle what was going on in September, because normally September isn't like that. But anyway, um, yeah, I, I, it basically redeemed his season that huge final month. And so he's practically a first rounder again, at least in five by five leagues. I think he's one player who deserves to go significantly lower by maybe more than a round in points leagues uh, and and shortstop being such a crowded position you know the fact he wasn't such a stolen base standout last year and the fact others at least i'm expecting stolen bases to be more plentiful and more widely distributed next year you know i can't see taking him in the first round i have him more like a late second round or even in five by five leagues but um it's clear that september changed a lot for his value and so if you if you tuned out for that you missed you missed Bo bichette's redemption Scott, in a vacuum, would you rather take Bo Bichette or Mike Trout? Let's say in oh, a row, because I think head to head points is Trout. Is 
Trout. Yeah. Chris, what yeah, do you think? I mean, even just for position scarcity reasons, Trout. Yeah. Chris, what do you think? Bobby Shett versus Trout. I I think I would take Trout. I haven't gotten to fine tuning the rankings yet. Yeah. No, I get it. Let's talk about an elite closer, Josh Hader, who at some point last season lost his closer gig with the Padres, who went out and obviously uh, traded a decent amount to get him from the Brewers. Hader had a 17 game stretch that took his ERA from 105 to 6.52. But then he did settle down quite nicely. His final 12 appearances, 0.79 ERA, 0.62 whip, and 11K per nine. There was some stuff going on off the field for Josh Hader. His wife's pregnancy had complications. And obviously, he was traded to a completely new team, new environment. Obviously, he's a human. There's things going on in his life. Chris, I don't think any of us are the ones to use a, a top three or even top four round pick on a closer. But did this late season flurry from Josh Hader uh, give you confidence to jump back in as like a top three or top five closer again. I, I don't know if it's as much as if it's the late season stretch as much as it's how much of an outlier that bad stretch was and how good he's been for so long that I, I don't have too much trouble buying back into him. You know, I, I could see, I guess, a scenario where it's like Craig Kimbrell, where he went from being untouchable to having some real issues. Um, but I don't know. I, I think there's enough explanations for why he might have struggled, even beyond just the, like, it's baseball, sometimes weird things happen for two months, and if you're not perfect, things can snowball. So I, I wouldn't draft him where he's going, which is 33rd overall in NFC drafts, and that'll probably drop. I think closer prices tend to drop as NFC drafts go on. But NFBC. NFBC you're, you're back in baseball mode. So. Yeah. Uh, but, um, you know, I think, like, I, I think he still deserves to be one of the first closers drafted whenever that is. And for what it's worth, we had Greg Jewett on last month, which is the closer whisperer, the closer aficionado, aficionado specializes in bullpens. Great fantasy player, by the way, too. Um, he has no concerns. He's back in on Josh Hader. So if you needed that confidence, uh, Greg Jewett does like him as well. Scott, speaking of confidence, it looks like we do have some confidence in Max Muncy after returning to form. Basically spent the first three, four months of the season quite terrible, at, like trying <laughs> to play through this UCL injury that he suffered uh, the year before. In the and, then, and then had an IL stent for it, which was, to, to me, the nail in the coffin. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, I think I wouldn't have been surprised if people were dropping Max Muncy last year as bad as he was. His final two months... Oh, yeah. He looked like Max Muncy, 247 batting average, 12 homers, 858 OPS, 92.3 mile per hour average exit velocity with a near 15% barrel rate. Is that enough for you to get back on track with Max Muncy? Yeah, it is. I and mean, especially when you consider he is eligible at, let me, let me double check this. It's oh, it's true. Scott. Talk about it. So yeah, he's second out, and third. Second and third. So the two weakest, scarcest positions, uh, the fact that he can be, Kind of a high-end fallback option. Somebody in 12-team leagues, you can probably get near around 10. Um, yeah, and, and the biggest for me, I mean, you, you went over the the batting average, the home runs, that average exit velocity. So, you know, the final two months, 92.3, which is great. Before that, it was 88.9. I mean, that is that is a turnaround that's reflected on a raw skill level. Even even going beyond the numbers, which you know the numbers support the turnaround as well, and I think it suggests whatever whatever happened to Muncie's elbow, whatever still exists in there, he has now proven that he's capable of overcoming it and swinging with the force necessary to perform like Max Muncie of old. All right, I've got four pitchers I want to get to, and then quickly talk about some prospects who got called up late in the season. Three of these guys were returning from injury. Luis Severino missed multiple months with a torn lat, uh, but then in his final start of the season, seven no-hit innings pitched. Jack Flaherty, his final two starts, he had 15 strikeouts over 12 innings pitched. Velocity was back on track there, uh, mid-93 to 94 miles per hour. And Trevor Rogers dealt with both back and lat injuries his final four starts, 3.72 ERA, 109 whip. The underlying number is much better. 23 strikeouts to four walks, I think, is a huge key there for Trevor Rogers. Lance Lynn, uh, he was returning from an injury earlier on in the season, but really, he just got back on track. 
his final two months, 2.43 ERA, 1.00 whip, flat, 9.1K per nine, and a career high 13.3% swinging strike rate. That's for the whole season, that swinging strike rate. Yeah, yeah. And, and it was fantastic for Lance Lynn. Chris, I know that you typically don't like to judge, you know, smaller sample sizes, obviously, but. Uh, I think it's better to see pitchers obviously perform later on in the season, returning from stuff than not. Uh, do you have any interest in these four names? Severino, Flaherty, Trevor Rogers, Lance Lynn. We don't, we, uh, the, the one I want to see. Yeah. So Flaherty's so cheap. He's 89 at pitcher right now, 230. My, my initial thought was I have no interest in Jack Flaherty. Cause I assumed he, I've always been lower on him than, than everyone else. And so I assumed that there was going to be, some buyback, but without that, I mean, at that price, I think he's fine taking a flyer on. Um, I'm skeptical that he's going to be a very good pitcher again, but at, at that price, it seems fine. I think, frankly, any of these guys are probably fine at their price. Um, Rogers, I don't have a lot of faith in just because the he was so bad for so long last season, um, and he was kind of a weird pitcher where he got by with like a really really good fastball that had a lot of deception and then that change up um so i'm not sure on him but lynn i feel fine the adp at 138 that seems like a really good value i think it was just he wasn't 100 percent coming back from that knee injury and severino i mean i have no idea if he can stay healthy at this point i would bet he can't um but if the discount's big enough i'll take a chance just like i would last year yeah, Severino is actually going inside the top 120 picks, so you're not. Yeah, that that's a on little him. iffy. Yeah. Yeah, Lance Lynn inside the top 150 as well. The other two there, Flaherty and Trevor Rogers, both outside the top 200 in early. So, I, so I I was thinking Severino was going low relative to Hunter Green earlier, and and you're saying it's a little uh, a little rich for you. So that's interesting. So I have I have Severino thirty fourth at starting pitcher versus Hunter Green forty second at starting pitcher. Uh, I, I mean, just I don't know. I, I'm the injuries don't really matter guy, but that's more for position players. With pitchers, like it's you know clearly with him, it's one pitching. It's a repetitive motion. You're throwing several thousand pitches over the course of the season. There's clearly been something in the way he throws that has prevented him from staying healthy. And the fact that it's been, you know, the whole kinetic chain, right? It's been elbow, shoulder, lat last year. Like that, that I think it's really f- unlikely he throws 180 innings this season. But you do get to a point in the pitcher rankings, and you know, 34th isn't especially high, uh, where you're not going to find yeah. proven durability unless it's, it, oh, yeah. You know, Merrill Kelly, who had a fine season last year, but I don't think anybody's drafting him on the level of Luis Severino. I think Severino and Kershaw is are pretty fair comps, right? Like, they're both – I think when they're healthy, they, they're both top 20 pitchers on a per-start basis. It's just how many innings are you getting out of either one of those guys, Luis Severino and Clayton Kershaw, right? I feel a lot more comfortable in the amount of innings I'm going to get from Kershaw. I, I, I just think it's probably, like – Maybe Severino has a better chance of 180, but a lower chance of 120, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, I have Kershaw ahead. Kershaw's really low on NFBC. Yeah. yeah. Really low. And yeah. Like, I like he's that. another guy where it's just, I don't know, we keep waiting for him to fall off, and it actually hasn't happened yet. And so it's like, when he's on the mound, I'm very confident he's going to be good. Yeah. yeah. And I think either one of those two, Severino and Kershaw, if you compare them with a – a Lance Lynn, who I guess is viewed as more of an innings eater type, although, you know, clearly he's he's still pretty serviceable when he's on the mound as well. Uh, I think that makes a lot of sense. But if you can get Kershaw as your, you know, SP3 or anything later than that, I, I think that's fantastic. Severino, for what it's worth, if you subscribe to the uh, contract year theory, this is it, 2023, a contract <laughs> year for uh, Luis Severino. So weird things happen. Players find a way to stay healthy in their uh, contract. I will say looking at the rankings, I think I'd rather take the flyer on Lucas Giolito than Mm. Severino. Um, But Mm. you know, I could see being out on him entirely. I am. Yeah. I have Giolito much lower. I have skill questions for him, but we don't need to get into those right now. (laughs) Right. It's, (laughs) it's health versus skills for those two. It's it's, again, I have no concerns over 
can Severino be good? It's just how long can he pitch for? I mean, Giolito, I, we'll save it for another day, but there are, there are many questions abound when it comes to Lucas Giolito. As you might have guessed, we're not going to get to prospects here today, but we have talked about prospects basically all off season with our buddy, the Welsh. So you can go back, you can listen to those. We did uh, position breakdowns for all prospects. So, uh, and, and we're going to talk about all these guys coming up in, in recent weeks and months as well. Big names, Corbin Carroll, Gunnar Henderson, Scott mentioned Tristan Casas, someone I like quite a bit as well. Uh, we'll get to all of them. But for now, we're going to wrap there. For Scott I, and Chris, I am Frank. Thank you all for listening and watching Fantasy Baseball today. We'll be back again next week. Bye-bye.